I am a, a freshwater ecologist and I do have to step outside my freshwater comfort zone onto land to understand how land use activities affect water quality. So today I'm stepping into the riparian zone. Riparian refers to the strips of land that occur along river courses and surrounding some other water bodies. So they mark the transition between aquatic and terrestrial <coughs> habitats or ecosystems. And as such, they have the characteristics or at least some of the characteristics of both ecosystems. They're also highly dynamic ecosystems characterized by variable soils, hydrology, periodic flooding, and unique combinations of animal and plant communities. Of course, the riparian zone varies in width and character along the length of a river course, as you can see here. And that is governed in part by the valley form, but also geography or geology and topography. So in today's presentation, I want to give you a general overview of the ecosystem services or the benefits that can be derived from riparian zones and how planting of native deciduous trees can maximize the benefits that we derive from those zones. And I will finish off by highlighting a few issues that we need to consider in this regard. Riparian and aquatic ecosystems are ranked among the top ecosystem provi services providers worldwide. In other words, providing benefits that we all depend on. But riparian zones probably produce or are known to produce disproportionately larger amount of services than any other ecosystem relative to their area. It's estimated that they cover just about 1% of the land area globally. And a quick back of the envelope calculation that I did last week would suggest that the figure is similar enough for Ireland. Over the past 200 years, approximately 80% of all riparian ecosystems across North America and Europe have either been removed or destroyed, leaving just bare, cultivated or grazed land. Now, we don't have figures for Ireland, but I reckon we're not far short of that. In fact, if you take, which I've done, if you take a, a Google Earth trip down the Midlands of Ireland, into the southeast, through Waterford, and into North Cork, you will see that many of the riparian zones have been cultivated or grazed right to the river margin. In fact, in another project that I'm involved in, which is on assessment of freshwater ecosystem services, is the so-called ES Manage project, and I've given you a link to it there. We have looked at the composition of the vegetation along a number of rivers in Ireland, in the riparian zone. And these are the figures here for the shore. And so the striking feature of that plot there is that pasture represents about 67% of the vegetation in riparian zones along the shore. Have a look at the figure for woodland. It's just 5% and there's about 10% of scrub there as well. So clearly there is great potential for future planting in the riparian zone and trying to maximize the benefits that we get from that planting. <clears throat> So this slide here gives you an overview of all of the ecosystem services or benefits which can be derived from woody riparian planting. So clearly trees have an effect on microclimate and that's mainly through their effect on humidity and also wind. And as I've said just a few minutes ago, riparian areas support a wide range of animal and plant species. They are important feeding areas and breeding areas. And also the linear nature of riparian habitats makes them very distinct and important 
corridors for animal movement and dispersion. And in fact, we, ver we know very little about that important service. It hasn't yet been quantified. In terms of carbon sequestration, that's probably best facilitated where large trees are allowed to grow in the riparian zones. But today I want to concentrate on the water-related services. So one of the most important functions of the riparian zone is, especially where it is wooded, is enhanced infiltration of water. The vegetation of the riparian zone creates a roughness which slows water flow and facilitates its absorption into the soils and recharge of groundwater. That same reduction in flow helps to reduce the flow of water into rivers and streams and therefore has an impact on mitigating the severity of some flood events as well as reducing the scarring of the riverbed. Reduction of flow is also important in terms of capture of sediments and some other pollutants. Now, it's well known that probably the most effective vegetation type for trapping of sediment is, is grassy strips. And all, they're also effective in trapping uh, sediment-bound phosphorus. But the planting of trees can facilitate the uptake of nitrate from subsurface flow partly because of the very extensive um, root system. Now, if you look at the literature, there's quite a variation in the figures regarding the effectiveness of riparian buffers for capturing pollutants, and Tom may speak a little bit about that. But there is one key message that is emerging and that is sort of captured in the graphic that I have here on the slide, and that is that mixed buffers with trees plus grass and other herbaceous vegetation gives us the best chance of capturing a wide range of pollutants. Of course, there are whole issues around the design of those in terms of width and species and spatial um, orientation, etc. Woody buffers also can dampen uh, water temperatures and this is particularly important in the context of climate change and protection of those species which are sensitive to increases in water temperature, such as salmon and trout. Again, the, this particular service is well reported in the literature, and the planting of trees can help reduce summer water temperatures by up to three degrees. But what is interesting and I think might influence how we design some of these wooded riparian buffers is that even very short stretches of wooded stream edge can have a marked effect on temperature. So for example, work carried out by Dermot Ryan, now with Inland Fisheries Ireland and one of my former PhD students, showed that short strips, they're only just about 300 metres, of semi-natural woody riparian planting can cool nursery streams by up to one degree. So there is great potential to capitalise on that particular service. Trees, as you know, also stabilise banks and reduce erosion. They provide overhanging um, banks and root wads, which are important uh, cover or habitat for fish species, in particular trout. So stable banks, together with low flow or flow moderation, helps to protect what we call stream hydromorphology. And that's one of the elements required in the Water Framework Directive, in particular for the high status rivers. Riparian zones, in particular woody riparian zones, also input a lot of other materials such as large wood, leaf litter and other energy subsidies into the river. Large wood is particularly important because it increases habitat diversity and complexity. And it is particularly important in river reaches which have very uniform substrates or lack of diversity in the substrates. 
So by having some wood, large wood in place, it increases that complexity and provides habitat and cover for fish, for example. Another important input from woody riparian vegetation is leaf litter. And that leaf litter fuels aquatic food webs both locally and further downstream. It can and it does increase secondary production, so you get higher abundances of invertebrates, for example, where you have a high input of leaf litter. And it is particularly important in the autumn and the winter when water temperatures are low and you get very little biofilm uh, production. And of course, woody debris dams can help hold some and retain some of that leaf litter. And that's part of the problem in some of the upland regions is that you don't have that retention of deciduous uh, leaf litter. Another important energy subsidy which is received from uh, woody riparian zones is insects. And these insects can make up a considerable proportion of the diet of fish, in particular trout. And again, going back a few decades to a piece of work that I did in, in my youth, it demonstrated that during the summer months, as much as 80% of the diet of trout can be made up of insects derived from marginal vegetation. So everything from green fly to wasps. And again, coming back to the work that Dermot Ryan did in the Slaney catchment, he demonstrated that even in September, a substantial proportion of the diet of trout was again of terrestrial origin, almost about 40%, and that was important for all age groups of fish. Now, there is always a concern that planting trees along the river will cast too much shade and therefore reduce primary production and that that, that would have a knock-on effect on the production of, of insects and therefore fish food, etc. Now, without doubt, if rivers are tunnelled for extensive lengths, you can have substantial reduction in primary and secondary production. And again, coming back to the work that Dermot Ryan did, he did demonstrate that there was slightly lower abundances of invertebrates in, in small streams that had riparian or uh, woody riparian vegetation, but that was compensated for by the input of terrestrial food into the fish diet. And there was always the potential to design and manage riparian uh, woodland so that you don't have excessive uh, shading. But one of the interesting findings that he made and that is highlighted by the arrows here on the chart, and that was that invertebrate abundances were significantly higher in the larger streams that had woody riparian buffers compared to those which didn't. And the reason being here is that those streams had the best of both worlds. They had enough light to have in-stream primary production, so biofilms and macrophytes, and at the same time they got that extra subsidy of leaf litter from the marginal trees that boosted the production in-stream. So I'm... I, to this point, I'm talking about the subsidy going in one direction into the streams. What we have to realize is this energy subsidies also go in the other direction because there is that tight connection between freshwaters and, and riparian habitats. So e the adult insects that emerge from freshwaters make a big contribution to the diet of many arthropods, for example, spiders living in riparian zones, but also to the diet of birds and bats. So again, emphasizing that close connection between the water and its margin, the riparian zone. So where do we go from here? There are two key characteristics of woody, natural, well-functioning riparian zones. And the first is connectivity. Connectivity internally along the length of the river channel and connectivity laterally to adjacent 
habitats or ecosystems. The second is heterogeneity, variety. We have to design and manage riparian woodland to maintain that heterogeneity. Because in part it gives us variety in communities, it also caters for the areas where we know very little. So for example, we don't know what are the habitat requirements of those terrestrial insects that emerge and move into the riparian zone. Some of them feed, some of them need certain markers for reproduction, etc. That is largely unknown. So until we address those knowledge gaps, the best bet moving forward is to maintain as much heterogeneity in the planting of riparian buffers. Now, one thing I should have mentioned earlier on is that in some areas, planting may not be recommended. So, for example, the high gradient peat covered uplands in Ireland, for example. And in other areas, we may have to plant outside of the riparian zone to fully capture the capacity to, to um, reduce pollutants. So planting, for example, in critical source areas or in areas of preferential flow. But I've just highlighted a few other issues that we need to consider as we design the planting into the future. And the first is that the benefits of the ecosystem services that are delivered by woody riparian buffers are scale dependent. So what you get at local scale will be quite different from what you get at catchment scale. So what I mean by what you get is whether or not you realize the benefit. So for example, at local scale, one can very easily detect the effect of the planting on temperature and in-stream uh, responses to leaf litter input. But at local scale, you may not be able to detect the effect or the benefit of pollutant reduction. That may require, and certainly does require, planting at larger scales. So the planting then, even at local scale, has to be designed to produce or to deliver as many benefits as possible. So in terms of pollution capture, we will have to think about the width of the riparian zone, the length of it, the density, the species composition, zonation within the riparian zone. So where do we place the woodland versus the grassy strips and so on. Then more important is the configuration across the catchment that will deliver the required services. So we have to think about how the buffer features created upstream will affect the efficiency of another um, benefit further downstream. And I read an article recently, and I cannot remember where I read it, but it said that for effective water quality protection, we may have to plant up to 70% of riparian areas with woodland. So that clearly demands a lot of land area. And I suppose that brings me on to the final point, which is how might that planting be best incentivized so that we can actually achieve those targets and have a measurable effect on water quality? And I suppose in some respects that hands me very nicely over to Tom, who is going to talk to you about payment for ecosystem services. So again, thank you for your attention.